All right. Um, yeah, so, uh, again, I'll put some more technical stuff in the description on why these gauges work so well. Um, so now we just got to uh, continue seeing how they're applied. Um, and in this case, we have uh, our next question, which states, in Chapter 5, I showed that it is always possible to pick a vector potential whose divergence is zero, i.e. the Coulomb gauge. Show that it is always possible to choose the divergence equal to negative mu naught epsilon naught uh, dvdt as required for the Lorenz gauge, assuming that you know how to solve the inhomogeneous wave equation. Is it always possible to pick v equals zero? How about a equals zero? Okay, well, what we need to know is both the Coulomb and Lorenz gauge. We saw them both last time. Divergence equals zero. Divergence is negative mu naught epsilon naught dv dt. And we have the gauge transformations where we can add the scalar and subtract the scalar lambda accordingly. So uh, let's dive in. So with this, let's first suppose that uh, the divergence of A does not equal the negative mu naught epsilon naught dv dt. Then what we can say is we have the divergence uh, plus the time derivative is equal to some function phi. Since they're not equal to one another, that has to equal something else. Okay. Uh, but this is per se some known function. And we want to pick lambda such that a prime and v prime do obey the uh, Lorenz condition. So hence we have uh, the divergence of a prime is equal to the negative mu naught epsilon naught dv dt prime or dv prime dt, excuse me. All right, so if that's the case, let's go ahead and add it over. Um, and we see on the left hand side, we have divergence a prime dv prime dt. Uh, let's go ahead and substitute in what a prime is from the gauge transformation, which is the gradient uh, lambda. Similarly here, let's go ahead and plug in the v prime. So we get v minus d lambda dt. And then you see, let's put everything in the red. We'll start color coding again. Once we distribute the, uh, the divergence into a and into lambda, we get divergence a in red plus the Laplacian of lambda in purple plus the mu naught epsilon naught dv dt in red minus the mu naught epsilon naught d squared, uh, or yeah, d squared lambda dt squared is equal to phi, the known function that we stated before, and plus the square uh, box lambda. Okay, um, again, we kind of saw what that square box was in 10.1. However, now we actually see it in its full-fledged authority this is known as the D'Alembertian operator, um, again, for the wave equation, uh, hence the statement and the, the way the statement was read. Uh, this will always be zero, provided that we pick lambda, the solution to um, the box squared lambda equals negative phi. Okay, and that's what we want. So we need, so the lambda has to, the box squared of lambda has to equal the negative phi in order for it to all work. Makes sense. Which by hypothesis, and in fact, we know how to solve. Okay, so that's why we said if they don't equal each other, then simply it equaling some scalar function uh, will allow us to set the wave equation. E so if we know how to solve the wave equation, the scalar function allows us to since box squared lambda equals negative phi is the uh, inhomogeneous wave equation. Um, so that's where we get all this technical stuff. We could always find a gauge in which V prime is zero simply by picking lambda equal to the integral from zero to T of V dt prime. We cannot in general pick A equals zero. This would make B equals zero since the curl of A of which would be the curl of zero gives you zero. So yeah, that's not always the case. Uh, but a good technical background, uh, you'll definitely see arguments like this done in PD courses um, if you're not familiar with them already. But good stuff.